There we go. Tom microphone has come up. Welcome once again to Legends of the Drowned Isles. Uh, I can see that. There we go. All the little bits and pieces have finally caught up to me. Technology, as usual, has decided to make a fool of me, as usual, but that's okay. I'm Mark the Incaffeinated One. I am the GM and uh, world creator and uh, general guffaw here for the Legends of the Drowned Isles campaign two, The Great Confusion. Uh, born out of uh, a need to change, uh, change for a little while, change and adapt as we play uh, and have now for 28 episodes. I, eventually, I'll, I'll remember to put the number on the screen at some point, but it's not this all about 29. me. This is 29. Well, there you go. That's right. Uh, this is not all about me, my world, and so forth, but rather it's about the crazy collection of characters played by our players, uh, starting on my left with Silas. Uh, my name is Pat. I am playing Silas Marsh. I currently have two computers here, so I will endeavor to make sure I hit the right uh, mouse when I'm doing stuff. <laughs> uh, and uh, currently, uh, Silas is all clean, waiting for the last of us to take her bath. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Murray, and I'm playing Annie, the human rogue, and I am about to go take a bath. Uh, and... I am also using two computers, so. Wow. So multiple mice. Pressure on uh, on you next to make sure you're using two computers as well. Hey, I'm next, and I'm playing Medric, half or cleric, who just had a bath and it was fucking lit. Uh, I do not have two computers, unfortunately. There's another computer next to me that's turned off. Does that count? Uh, sure. And there's another computer yet next to me that's broken, which probably doesn't count. <laughs> Uh, it, it seems to be the, the way to handle uh, everything these days, though, is to have at least one extra computer. If it's only your phone, that still counts. So, uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, giving us a bit of a summary, let's, let's uh, go back to what happened in the uh, previous session. Having rescued the being trapped in the center of the Stormbringer device, introductions are in order. This person appeared to be a giant feminine elemental standing nearly 12 feet tall, although her exact height was difficult to determine as she seemed to hover above the ground by several inches. She appeared to be made of living semi-translucent crystal, but her body seemed like it was flowing and non-rigid. After some initial language issues, which she seemed to overcome on her own, and I'll just point out that uh, I think, Pat, in the summary you, you put on the page, you described it as tongues. It's a tongues-like effect, but you just did, did not cast a spell. Uh, she introduced herself by her childhood name, Regalesta, after discovering that she could not remember her proper name. This was, the group suggested, the same result of the great confusion that manifested in many. Regalesta described herself as half Athlonian, a people that exist now only in myth. Her other half, on her father's side, was an elemental mirrored. Throughout the conversation, she refers to others, humans, elves, and dwarves specifically, as lesser peoples, displaying a casual but sometimes self-conscious awareness of an apparent common bias of her people. She half stumbled, then re revealed that she sorry, she half stumbled, then revealed what she had feared. Her heart had been removed, and when she heard of the storm, she agreed that it may very well have been used for that purpose. She looked around and discovered also that her trident was missing. Medric showed her the vase with Taraz Nakma Daugul's name on it and she smashed it immediately. Remembering him as the greatest and most terrible of her people, she feared his return, as the Stormbringer was one of his inventions. He was believed dead and must not return. As acid flowed into the room, Regalesta suggested that they must leave, and looking around the chamber described it not so much as a room, but more like a digestive organ, a stomach to fuel something greater. After scavenging a few of the magic crystals which proved to have the capacity to restore life, she opened the portal a group had come through before, and returned once again to the broken temple in the sewers beneath Ilthwater, somewhat surprising Marta, who had been waiting for hours. As she approached her, Regalesta shifted her form to that resembling an elf, with pale blue skin that seemed to shimmer with little crystals. To the rest of the group, it resembled Lysandra, a strange woman they had rescued from the Sea Devil Grotto some time ago. Hearing them describe another with this form, Regalesta commented, commented casually that it was nice to know that the sea elves were still known here. Actually, the word she would have used was aroka, 
which is an ancient and somewhat legendary word. Sea elves themselves are kind of mythical and legendary, almost like the Athlonians. Um, she also used the term Sekmahawagan, not Sahuagan, uh, and which itself is also a very uncommon word. The more colloquial word sea devil is what most people know them as. The group was forced to wait and rest in the ruined temple, as the tide had come in while they had been away. They gave, that gave them a few minutes to relax, and Marta discussed return, turning the temple into something usable for the sewer workers, once the hole was covered over, of course. When they were finally able to go above, they discovered that the storm which once engulfed the town had ceased, and sky could once, once more be seen. However, water pelted down heavily in places, and I just scrolled and lost my place, uh, and they can just make out the source. A massive water spout throws water up high into the sky, randomly washing over Eilthwater. This, they conclude, is the other end of the storm, as was predicted before. Overall, it is immediately obvious that the greater part of the oppressive feeling in the town has been removed. However, tired and worn down, they decided that the immediate threat to the town was over. They bid, bid farewell to Marta and went back to their familiar inn, the Three Bells, to find some comfort and rest. Notably, not telling anybody uh, other than Marta how successful they had been. The inn was as busy as ever, and all heads turned when the disheveled, somewhat smelly, worn group arrived. The fourth member of the group, the transformed Regalesta, saw food on a table and immediately took it, relishing in the tastes, but causing a bit of disruption to the person whose food it was. Regalesta, it seemed, did not recognize things like property or possession, or considered herself above all of that with the lesser peoples. Andy decided that she would need to teach her a few things and ushered her out of the room. Meanwhile, Medric talked to the offended patron to calm him down, the fellow, a builder named Lawrence, admitted that while he was not a religious man, he respected the good that the flamekeeper did, and always appreciated the certainty that the flaming pillar of the temple represented. He admitted he, did, he knew who Medric was, and knows what Medric has accomplished, and pledged to help if the temple is ever to re be rebuilt. Pardon me, is ever to be rebuilt. An additional stove in the washroom was lit by Sandy, promising lots of hot water for the group to each bathe in, a welcome luxury after the toil in the sewers. The first to relax was Silas, but when he was done, Mother Hydra drew him into the water and appeared to him floating in an endless sea. Unlike her usual enigmatic, distant, indirect communication or her otherwise aloof, unshakable form, however, she appeared before Silas as deeply concerned, almost frantic. The shift in power that happened when the Stormbringer was destroyed has revealed to her the sense of Taraz Nakma Dagaul, a being whom she fears. Silas promised to take care of it, but boldly asked her questions. First, he asked if, he, if she had concerns about his working for Catheron, but she suggested that it was of little concern, and that she could handle that being when the time came. Then he asked about his wife's death. To this she seemed to express a fleeting sorrow, but then became her enigmatic self once more, declaring that not all who hear my words understand them. Mistakes can be made, and mistakes can be unmade. The vision faded, and Silas retired. Medric was next to relax in the bath, although he found the water cooler than he would have liked. Sticking his hand into the fireplace, he surged the fire hotter, to the point where it was nearly boiling. Once out of the tub, he discovered that he continued to steam and could smell smoke. Where his feet touched the wooden floor, it had been scorched into clear footprints. And then... His entire body was lit afire, and burned without pain. He could feel the power of Ignis surging within him, and he reached out to it, asking, What can I do? Within him, within him, wordless and yet certain, came the response. Fight! The flames relaxed, and Medric discovered that water in the boiler was dry. When he went downstairs to tell Sandy about it, she remarked on his rather interesting eyes, and when he met up with the others, they told him that his eyes now seemed to glow, like small twin suns. In the meantime, Annie had been trying to help Regalesta understand, quote, how to human. It was clear that the Athlonian woman's conception of everyday life was very different from what most people experience, although, although not entirely unrelatable to that of a princess. And that's where we begin. Uh, for those who didn't hear it from last time, uh, the characters all leveled up after their experiences and having a chance to, to breathe. 
Uh, I don't know if it's happened before, but apparently bathing is the key to leveling up. Um, I'm assuming that Annie is going to take uh, some time to to uh, to get the stink off. Yes, uh, she is probably going to stay in there a little bit longer and rush in the fact that it's basically a sauna in here now. So as, uh, you, go, <laughs> as you go to leave, Regolesto seems like she wants to go with you, not thinking too much of it. Um, she's not really one for public bathing. Um, so she'll say you can, you can use it after and then go. <laughs> Silas will uh, say, uh, don't worry, Regalesta, there'll be plenty of water left. Uh, Annie? Yes? Yeah. Uh, can I, do you mind if I make copies of the keys the captain gave you? In case he takes can, them back. You can do that. I prepared some stuff so that I could make a mold of the keys. Uh, I can't directly copy them myself, but we should be able to make copies from the molds. I mean, I'm sure I can get my hands on them again. Uh... Sure. I just figured it might be useful in case we have our quick need to get into the tunnels at some point. Um, I mean, I can probably, I'd prefer asking. I don't want to get on his bad side. Okay. Um, also, uh, I just wanted to mention, we definitely did tell Sandy that we were responsible for the storm going away. Yes. Sandy, yeah, yeah. Sandy hears everything. Anyway. Kind of forgot kind of forgot about the going back to report, but you guys oh, were well, pretty, pretty well. To clean up first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the captain's still going to be there tomorrow. Exactly. Um, if I can get those necklaces and the uh, rat, uh, I can go th uh, I can go over them while you're bathing. Yeah. Uh, I give the the two necklaces, the rat, the box, and uh, I don't know if we divided up the crystals yet, but we have six of them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I, two each sounds good. I am assuming that you guys are keeping track of those. I, I don't have those on my list of things. So. Yep. Okay. Um, Annie goes to take her bath, and the room explodes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the water is quite warm. The rat. <laughs> That's what the rat does, yes. It makes bathrooms explode. Um, Good thing I don't have it with me. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the soap is crude. The water is, a, is as fresh as they can get it. In this moment, it probably feels pretty good. Although, I would imagine that because of the similarities that, that even even as distant as they are with Regalesta that you're finding, there may be a little bit of memory of, you know, the grand bath and how it would have been perfumed water that had been carefully, uh, you know, strained and there would be uh, brand new towels every time you went, that sort of thing. I don't know if that oh, yeah. what evokes in Annie, but I can imagine those memories are at least there. Oh, yeah. She, she's going to make the best of the situation that she can basically and enjoy the basic the enjoy the sauna yeah the room is still is still steaming you actually do see the uh the blackened floor with two very distinct footprints about the size of medrick's feet uh just outside the bathtub it's it's now a permanent feature of the of the three bells to have this orc footprints apparently Whoopsies. It's artistic. <laughs> um, otherwise, it's just, just a relaxing bath. Nothing strange yep. happens to you. Proving proving that this bathroom is not haunted. It is, it is not an effective <laughs> bathroom. I, I, I was starting to worry. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, what are you doing with these things, uh, Silas? These, uh, these items? Uh... Checking to see if there's anything arcane about them. 
Okay. Like the, the necklace and like an amulet or something. So he wants to see if there's any symbols on it. Basically, he'll take a short rest to study them and uh, say the stuff you would do with an attunement, except he also actually has training in Arcana. Okay. You don't have detect magic or identify, right? Nope. He doesn't have the quick ways of doing it. Okay. Um, give me uh, an arcana roll. We're going to go through each of them in, in turn. Um, what is your, your arcana bonus, actually? Because you are trained, right? Yep, I've got a plus six. Okay. Um, He's trained and he's very smart. All right, so we'll go through the items. I will give you a base just because you have a high arcana to begin with. Um, there is a necklace made of semi-precious stones with an ivory re relief of a man's head on it. Um, it does not appear to have any magical qualities whatsoever, or if there, or if there are any magical qualities, uh, they are either well hidden uh, or somehow other, otherwise buried. There is a pendant with a growling lion's head on it. Um, you do notice from both the way the material is made and from the uh, from the uh, sort of quality of the material, the mix of the materials, and from some uh, embedded symbols. This definitely seems to be magical in some way. Uh, on that one, I can have you make an actual uh, arcana roll. 24. Yeah, no problem. Um, kind of hey. putting putting it on and wearing it for a moment, you kind of feel the sense of the strength of the lion, and it fills your soul with some strength. Um, you realize that this is, in fact, a magical charm. Uh, I'll, I'll give up the, the write-up here at one at point, but I'll describe it in a moment. Mm -hmm. It is a charm of courage. It is non-attunement, has three charges. Each charge expended grants plus two versus the save for frightened. Up to three charges can be expended at once. So you can get a total of plus six on that if you want. Um, it uh, uh, recharges... Oh, I don't have that part in this particular note, but it recharges uh, 1d4 charges uh, at uh, dawn. Okay, and I assume it wouldn't charge more than three? Right, maximum of three. Okay. Neat. Um, you take a look at the mouse. Um, it is still sealed inside, but has a little bit of a of a, of a uh, the sound of sand and little rocks swirling on the inside. You imagine that um, while it's somewhat sealed, there still are opening and looks like that uh, gravel and sand and water have all flowed onto the inside. Um, despite that, it seems to be in relatively good condition. Uh, it's a little bit larger than your palm uh, in height, um, a little bit rounder than, say, two fists balled together at its fattest. Uh, it does indeed seem to have uh, two uh, rubies embedded in the, the head of the mouse. Moving it a little bit, although a little bit rusted and, and sand filled on the inside, it appears that the uh, limbs do in fact move, as does the head, as does the tail, and the ears actually move independently as well. Um, scraping off a little bit of the uh, dirt on the back, you discover what looks like a keyhole on the back of it. Uh, and from looking at it, while there's nothing on the surface which uh, cries out for magic, um, the unless you're going to try to open it up or crack it open or anything like that, you can't see the insides. But you sort of in from the hole, you can see what looks like gears. And you imagine for this to actually work, um, it would either need a key or some other activator. It probably has something magical that is behind the uh, gems. Okay. But it doesn't seem to function right now. Not at present, no. It looks like it got too waterlogged and kind of buried in sand before sort of being swept okay. up into the into the junk pile. And if I go to move like the tail or the limbs or something, do they move freely like a wooden doll would? Or do they seem to have some sort of connections that they're like kind of frozen in place, but they can like jiggle them slightly? Yeah, um, it's more the latter. Um, it feels as though there's some resistance on the inside, but the resistance gives way every once in a while, convincing you that, you know, they are supposed to move, uh, but have some some mechanism attached to them from the inside. Okay. Uh, it's just completely seized up at the moment. 
Okay. Um, do the rubies look big enough to be valuable, or are they just like tiny little things? Uh, each of them is larger than the end of your thumb and would probably be pretty valuable. Wow, yeah. And uh, for the, the necklace, it was just gemstones. Uh, again, does that look like it's a big neck, like a neck, big gemstones that are worth a lot? Or again, it's just a small uh, set of gemstones that uh, isn't likely worth a huge note? It looks like a couple of dozen small semi-precious stones. Um, do you have uh, an, a skill for um, for evaluating things? Uh, there isn't really one, except uh, well, actually, there isn't really one. Um, there, there would be um, jeweler's kit. Yeah, uh, there'd be one for actually making jewelry, mm -hmm. which would likely cover that. There's no general. Uh, That's not what I asked, though. I asked you if you have a skill you think is appropriate to this. Um, okay. I'm just saying that unless it's investigation, there isn't a skill for appraisal. Uh, and I don't have specific training in gemstones. So okay. I'm just wondering as a general thing, it's like, does it look like, woo hee, we got something big here? Or, oh, this looks like the gemstones mom wears on Sunday night. Uh, well, most people don't wear gemstones. Um, so any gemstones would be considered to be somewhat valuable. Um, kind of taking a little time to, to scrape some of the dirt and, and uh, stones away, it does look like it was very well made. Uh, the stones are not large, but they seem to be actual gemstones, um, and it seems to be in fairly good condition. Uh, actually, sorry, it would be clean. It was inside the box. Um, so it, it seems to be uh, somewhat valuable. Okay. Uh, and finally, I think the fourth thing on your list was the box itself. Uh, yeah, sure. If you'd check that over to see if there's anything interesting. The first thing you notice about the box is it is a very fine quality wood. It has a little bit of, uh, of what looks like uh, silver, uh, essentially gilding. There's, a, there's an embedded silver uh, square across the top. It has a decent lock on it, not not a super strong one, but one that uh, would ev would uh, make it difficult for the casual uh, casual observer. This one was not locked at the time. It looks like it takes a key, but the key was not with it. Um, and uh, the sort of taking a look at the box and looking at the comparing it with the mouse or with the the metal rat, uh, it sort of strikes you very quickly that it's in excellent condition. The box shows no signs of wear, no signs of warping. Even the dirt doesn't seem to have touched it, touched it all that well. The box itself is magical. At least that's what you conclude. Uh, and designed to keep things safe. And indeed, the two uh, necklaces that were within it were not covered in mud or dirt or water at all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other than that, Silas will just, uh, I guess, do some chatting with uh, uh, Regalesta and uh, Medrick if he's there, and just wait for yeah. Annie to get back from her bath. He'll be slightly listening for the sounds of screams or anything going on. <laughs> As one does. From the bathroom, <laughs> there might be a few a uh, few squeals of happiness as the warm water settles into tough muscles, but uh, I don't imagine that Annie is uh, being too uh, too vocal. Um, it, well, it's so hard to startle her; uh, almost impossible. That's true. <laughs> yeah, seeing as how the last two baths went, he's not sure that this is going to go ordinary. <laughs> hey, my uh, bath went great. <laughs> Be uh, before I go into the bath, I probably like before before I step into the bath in the bathroom, I'm gonna make my my ring appear and then disappear again, uh, just to make sure it's there. <laughs> okay, yep, the ring is is still there. It looks pretty grimy based on what you've been through. 
and it itself probably needs a bit of cleaning. Um, yep. And you, you've got that we'll familiar kind of, uh, yeah, you've got that familiar kind of experience that anybody has worn a ring for a while and you forget that it's on. And you do a bunch of stuff. If you get that ring underneath the ring, which is where your skin is <laughs> a little bit softer and a little bit uh, discolored, uh, just from not being so tanned. Um, well, what we're going to do then for Silas and Medrick, since you guys are talking with Regalesta, um, rather than do it in sort of a real-time chat, sort of the same idea that I had with Annie last time when she was there. Um, how about each of you come up with either a question uh, or some aspect of Regalesta that you would try to ask? Now, obviously, if it's going to be prying or... or uh, or deeper, or something that might be secret, that might require a role, but uh, the casual question, or something more you want to know about her, uh, and I'll try to respond in character for that. So, uh, do either one of you have something in particular that you would like to, to ask? Oh, sure. Um, while he's working away at stuff, He'll ask Craig Alesta how she figures that her people were superior since they're all dead and we're <laughs> still around. Okay, okay. Let's make this awkward right off bat. Um, <laughs> He's mildly offended at how she was acting. Let's, uh, so first of all, there would be sort of a visceral reaction from her that's a combination of things. Um, it, there's sort of an initial response, which is almost shock followed fairly quickly by laughter uh, as if she sort of um, sort of accepts the absurdity of the of the of the statement or, or accepts the absurdity of the of the claim given that sort of evidence um, but she'll grow kind of a little quieter and and reflective um, and simply say it took a consortium of gods to destroy my people whereas yours are destroyed every day. On an individual basis, yes, but as a group, we persist. We had conquered disease, aging. All of your mortal problems were gone. We were the best, but we reached too far to replace the gods. And so a bit who of started the bitterness. war? That is a matter of opinion. I do not know the specifics of what happened. But I know this. My people saw the gods and saw the status that they had with the common person. They saw the power that they wielded, even as distant as they were, and decided they wanted it. So, whether they began the fight or the gods decided this threat was too big to ignore... I do not know, but the war was quickly upon us and bitterly fought. More than one god was destroyed in this, but my people did not come out the better. Which ones were destroyed, if you remember? Their names are forgotten. That is the fate of a destroyed god, I think. With no one to remember them, the power was dissipated, taken, used, and became someone else's, became that of the Athlon, that of our people. So if people kill gods, they take their powers? That was the ambition. I was not present for most of this fighting. I was, and her face kind of grows uncertain. I was elsewhere. Uh, Silas will look uh, over at her and then over at uh, Medric and say, but if you kill a god, their memory is gone. I believe they are removed from the celestial memories. But everybody else's memory of that, are those removed too? 
And then Silas will look back at her. It's like, and then Medvir can say, maybe that's what happened. Why everybody's memories seem to have disappeared. Do you know the name Philoaxis? Philoaxis? Yes. Yeah, I'm assuming Silas doesn't. It's not a name you're familiar with. No question to the DM. Would Medric know that word? You make a history check. All right. History minus one. <laughs> no. It doesn't ring a bell. Is that like some kind of pastry? When I was young, the poet Philoaxis was known by all. The stories were told to every child. Everyone, even of the lesser peoples, admired the great works of Philoaxis. But Silas Philo flinches slightly at that. But Philoaxis died, was killed. And in time, it may have taken a hundred years, but in time, all the works were forgotten and were no longer taught to the children. I think it is so with the but gods as well. When they are no longer a part of people's lives, everyone just simply forgets them. And what pieces were remaining were taken by those who killed them. So if a, if a god dies, other entities will try to take their position? I suppose. Certainly, with my people, that was their intention. I'm just thinking about the current confusion and things that are going on. There was a big war. I don't remember any of it. And nobody remembers anything. So that means there is extra space to take, and this Taraz guy is supposedly maybe coming back. That doesn't sound good. No. Silas says, I wish Annie was here and wasn't taking a bath. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> cut back tastefully to Annie. Ah. She's probably in there for like a solid like half hour. A <laughs> little bit, a little bit uh, pruny fingers by the time you're done. Yep. Kind of wishing you had those uh, those those delicate oils that could be added to the bath that keeps the skin supple and and uh, and nice and and gets rid of all of the extra corns and all of the, you know, maybe a manicure, mani pedi would be nice right now, you know. But yep. But it is what it is. It is what it is. And it was all, what it all was. This, all this reminds me that I need to put my hand cream on. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly everybody starts to feel really dry around the fingers. Um, but the, the bath is delightful. There was plenty of hot water. When you step out, you discover that Medrick's feet are a lot larger than yours, if that's truly Medrick's feet on the floor. Um, it, it's, an odd, it's an odd place, but it's kind of like the position where a bath mat would be. <laughs> so... Um, Yo. And you return to hear them discussing different things uh, back in the room. So I can imagine you kind of heard the last few words. <laughs> <laughs> so, anything weird happen? Silas so asks Annie. No. Huh. It, was, it was quite a nice bath. Well, that's good. Uh, Mind you, nothing contacted me through my mind without my permission. So I wouldn't let anything disturb me in my bath anyway. That's good. It is good to see that you have such control over your mind. I think it is rare among the lesser peoples. Silas flinches again. I'll just roll my eyes. <laughs> Every time he lesser peoples, he uh, flinches slightly. 
And when she says it, there's no sort of mocking or malice. It's just to her, it's like an everyday phrase. Just matter of fact. Kind of. Disturbingly so. Um, okay, Silas starts handing stuff back to Annie. Um, this box is magical. It's not very big, but apparently it'll protect what's inside it. So if, you, if we have anything that needs protecting, this little box will, I guess, keep stuff out. Yeah. I mean, we don't have a key for it, so we have to pick the lock any time that yeah. we want to open it. Um, this Actually, necklace... Uh, Silas, can you make an Arcana roll? And Annie, do you have Arcana trained? No. Okay, so Silas, make an Arcana roll. Okay. Eight. There's something about the lock on that box, but nothing really occurs to you as to what, what's twigging your mind. Hmm. We have to look at it later once we've got some time. Um, he hands over the gemstone necklace. There's a bunch of semi-precious gems. Uh, this is this doesn't appear to be magical. Uh, we can probably sell it someplace for maybe a decent amount. I don't know. Yeah, um, it looks uh, say that the the ivory relief of the man's head does look like it was specifically carved, not a general man's head shape. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Do any of us recognize the face? Yeah, like could I make a history check to see if any of anything about this? Yeah, or is it not a coin or anything? Um, it's not a coin as such, but I will, if you train in history, I'll allow a history check. Uh, I will okay. give, uh, give Annie advantage on this roll. Ooh. As you take a closer okay. look at this necklace now that you have a moment of uh, 14. 14, okay. And we get a history roll from, is Silas... Nope. Okay. Uh, not trained in it. Medrick is not trained in it either. I'm not trained and I got a minus one. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, Annie, the, I'm a the non historian. Head, the head looks familiar. Um, so it is it is a person that you sort of recognize, but you can't place exactly who it is. Um, you get the feeling that it's someone who is uh, sort of a, a leader, maybe a, a baron or maybe. Uh, like a city mayor or maybe some other nobility. Um, knowing that, um, this was a gift from a noble. And that probably means it's a bit worth a bit more in the right in the right hands. I wonder if the captain could, would recognize who it is or even Dr. Marigold. I don't think so. Um... The captain might, but if I'm recognizing it as a possible high royal uh, baron or the such, it it probably wouldn't be someone in their circles. Um, but I'll ask Gaetano. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right, what's up now? So, because they made port, but we haven't seen them yet. Um, uh, he holds up the rat. Says, I'm pretty sure this is a mechanism of some sort. And those rubies are pretty big. Um, and... You said there was something magical about it, Mark, or there was not something magical? Uh, there does seem to be something magical in it, um, yeah. just in the way that the seams are constructed, and there seems to be a little bit of rune uh, magic embedded within it, but it's not familiar yeah. to you. And so you said rune or room? Uh, rune, R-U-N-E. There's little okay. tiny runes around the seams indicating some sort of magical connection. Um, Can you decipher those? 
it's not a language I speak, unfortunately. And would recognize that right? recognize. I'm trained in Arcana, but I'm not actually a wizard. So that's a little outside my area. Um, but I pull out the pieces, uh, the two pieces of the machinery that I brought from below. Is there anything similar in this? Like he'll look at the, the seams and the pieces. Um, mm. Like looking either for runes used in a similar way or runes that kind of look similar. Uh, like, I mean, there's, there's, in life, there's many different sort of runic languages, but they tend, like, one language will tend to look like a certain way. Hmm. Uh, um, go ahead and make an arcana roll. We'll determine the degree of success here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Ten. Comparing the two side by side, there's definite similarities. Um, the the small runes and there's not a lot of them they just they were kind of hard to notice on the the rat itself um they look the only way word you can kind of come up with is primitive when compared to the ones on the bits of machinery there are yeah. a few similar uh similar letters i guess you would say or symbols um they look like lesser versions or simplified versions on the rat um there seems to be a lot more subtle complexity to the ones that were on the great machine um, whereas the, the rot seems like it was of a similar sort, but um, not done with the same level or awareness of skill. Yeah, like a, a, something like uh, the machinery was made by, an, uh, by a master and the rat was made by an apprentice. I'll be right back. Signs? Um, there's, or there's like definitely... someone who was like, mimicking it almost and trying to do it but just wasn't nearly as good it's a little more of the latter the the rat does show signs of fine quality and and well manufactured or well made um yeah and the the, the runes are are aligned well they're they're you know properly straightened uh, or curved as necessary and they're embedded in the metal of the surface of this of this rat so it does show some skill and mastery um, but it's more like they didn't know the original. If the other is, is considered to be the original, they didn't know it and were having to either improvise or uh, had a poor teacher or just had poor sources. Yeah, okay. So can I, do I see the runes I on mean, the rat? If, if Silas hands it to you and points them out oh, there. Yeah. Once it's cleaned off, it's actually much easier to see. Because yeah. I'll ask, uh, hey, Regalista, can you figure out what this does or what this says? And she uh, she accepts it from you, kind of looks it over. Um, what an interesting little toy. And she kind of waves her hands over it, and little swirls of water come out of her fingertips and start to sort of almost sand blast or water blast the... the uh, the outside of it kind of shining off the surface, um, revealing kind of the, the fairly good quality metal that even though it's a little pitted from what it, what time it's spent, uh, kind of comes out almost with a sheen, uh, making them a lot easier to read. And she holds it up and kind of turns it sideways so she can bring along the, the back seam. These are very crude. This person is a child. We taught our children better than this, but there was some acceptance for learning stages. From what I can... By... Or someone of lower intellect. Uh, you can make a, a intuition, or a... What's the word? Not intuition. Insight? Uh, insight check. Dip. Ten. <laughs> Um, although you, it's hard to, to know exactly um, what she intends by that, um, you get the impression that she's just basically entirely unimpressed, um, and she's she's trying to be slightly diploma diplomatic by insinuating, "Oh well, you know, it's terrible, but it was probably made by someone who was just learning," um, as opposed to Silas's uh, sort of suggestion that. Uh, 
this is actually a masterwork item. Um, <laughs> and it, it, well, it's hard to suggest that just someone who was less capable was doing it, that the masterwork was the other pieces. Hmm. These, these are somewhat wrong. From what I can understand, though, it is um, something of a command or a, um, a sort of opening for a command to give this thing life of sorts. We had many such toys when I was younger. And she casually tosses it back to Medric. Almost Don't catch like, it. Forgetting about it. Forgetting about it. So you say a command word and it acts. Something along those lines. That is the reception for that. It is as though it has been given um, a a spark that can be lit. It can be lit, eh? In a manner of speaking. Yeah. Can you figure out what the command word is? No. That is like asking to have the question when all you have is the answer. You can make up all sorts of things, but none of them will be exactly correct. Besides, I think it is um, uh, asleep. I think we might know who that has the answer, though. Clockwinder. You mean he made this? I think so. Uh, we were told there were rumors of small mechanisms guarding his warehouse. Right, it could be a lead. Not something we can deal with yet. We have to go uh, get Regalesta's heart first. Get rid of the the water spout, but it's something for later. Yeah, we have oh. to speak to him anyway. Yeah. Maybe this could be an in, because he does like his privacy. If we tell him we found something of his, or if he knows we found something of his, he might be more likely to meet with us. Yeah. Um, now, this last piece with the lion face, um, it's uh, a charm of courage. Uh, the wearer can draw upon it for strength in the face of fear. And then it will slowly regenerate the magic that it contains. That's useful. Hmm. Uh, yes. Um, Uh, Silas will hand them back to Annie. Uh, he'll ask if he can keep the rat for now uh, until we can talk to Clockwinder. I have no issue with that. Okay. If that's it, um, Silas says, uh, we'll probably pop downstairs for a bit, but, uh, Mark, you said last time that uh, it was now nighttime when we came up? Um, yes, by the time, um, because uh, you had spent some time down there, time away, then had to wait for the, the tide to also come out. So, Yeah, uh, so that, that, uh, he just lets Silas, uh, let, uh, lets uh, Annie and Medrick know that uh, he's just going to head downstairs for a bit of supper and then uh, head home. Uh, he'll meet you guys back here in the morning. Yeah, supper sounds like a good idea. That sounds like a good idea. Um, I'm going to write quick, write a note uh, to the captain uh, to let him know we figured out part of it. We need to go figure out the next part of it. 
Uh, but we're halfway to getting the storm done. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I'll see if uh, Sally has someone who can run that to the captain. Sandy. It's probably kids all over that you could just pay like a copper to deliver it. Um, it's probably how they make money. Yep. Oh, we can fast forward a little bit, and uh, Sandy does have one of the kitchen helpers, so be willing to do it. Uh, she doesn't need. It. She doesn't. She kind of uh, voluntold, uh, voluntells uh, young. Uh, um, let's see. Give me a name. Is it Give the same name. guy who? Is it the same kid who went to send the the? I, I don't have it in this book. Uh, but when we had to send someone to let Gaetano know or the ship know? Sure. Do you remember his name? No, I don't have, <laughs> I have my new book, not my old notebook. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll write, write a note here of messenger kid and see if I remember what that means. Um, but yeah, that message is sent off. Um, you have some, uh, have some, have a meal downstairs as you're, as you're, uh, having your meal, the, the, the general mood in here seems to be uh, lighter. Um, you get the impression that as soon as the storm overhead had, had ended, a lot of people had come out into the streets and kind of just breathe a little relief because they'd all been essentially locked up inside. Not like we can sympathize with that at all. Uh, and <laughs> uh, a lot of people flooded in this particular place as well because uh, shared camaraderie. And, and you're seeing again, as you usually do in the inn, um, a lot of very familiar faces who come around here. Um, Lawrence nods to Medrick in particular, as you're seeing downstairs. Although there is a bit of a, a furor at first when Medrick first appears with his glowing eyes. Uh, many people had seen it last time he came through, but many more are kind of seeing it, pointing, and then kind of whispering quietly or loudly to themselves about it. Um, Sandy Don't worry, it's not dangerous. I'll just see how energy, no general, no particular direction. That's metric. He's so hot right now. Yeah. <laughs> is this how we, oh wait, this is a guy they're going to they're going to gauge normalcy in this town. Pardon the pun, uh, because they're going to use the metric system in, in, order, in order to measure measure the normality in the town. Oh, <laughs> I usually try not to, but I just could not resist. Um, but it's it's a warm meal. the The meal is a little bit thin. You get the impression that they're running a little bit low on on full sets of supplies. The town's been essentially under siege for a long time, and not a lot of supplies have come in. Um, the last crops from the fields that thankfully are outside of the massive storm uh, are essentially what are coming in at this point. Um, there may be something from the Winthrop farm, for example, uh, as they're back into full service. Um, Silas, do you perform for the evening? As well, is that what you said? Yes. All right. Um, uh, yes, Silas is going to perform a new story. It's a story about the three heroes uh, who were sent to save the town by uh, the captain of the guard. And with uh, various illusions, uh, he's going to put on a show uh, showing basically what we did but with the the primary characters obviously being a uh, a lady noble and a cleric of fire uh, and a probably a slightly shadowy uh, wizard type uh, who saved the town from a machine that was bringing a storm. He won't use names specifically. But anyone who knows us well enough, like Sandy, is definitely going to pick it out. He also so you're not being subtle at all. <laughs> slightly subtle, but not a whole lot. He's putting it more into the character archetypes than using our names. Um, and he does not mention Regalesta at all. Her part in it does not happen. Uh, but the part about going below the town, finding the strange room, defeating the... Uh, the machine uh and coming up to find a town that was well still kind of being sprayed but was not didn't have the depressive clouds around uh yeah that'll all be there it's kind of uh really in the moment <laughs> um 
Okay. Make a uh, a performance check. Uh, 14. Yeah, that's pretty good. Does he get advantage from the illusions? Um, if so, it's an 18. So yeah, it doesn't change sure. things a lot. But. Sure. Uh, the illusions definitely help to sell the story. And you get the impression, too, that um, people were really hungry for something. You know, they were kind of hungry for, for being around each other for a while. Again, not intending to to uh, parallel anything that happens to be any form of reality, but seemingly that's what we're all doing anyway. Uh, but the, the story is is uh, is sort of well appreciated. And Medrick, uh, you get a, a look from Lawrence a little bit later on, that, sort of like that, uh, you know, I know really, you know, what's going on uh, kind of thing. Uh, even Regalesta seems some actually she seems somewhat confused. Uh, and at one point, uh, you take a pause towards the end and people are clapping and you hear her call from the other side of the room, but that's not what happened. Yeah. <laughs> He's ready for that and starts up the next verse just a half second after she starts speaking. <laughs> and she sort of turns uh, also, to Andy and Medrick kind of confused, but that, that's not accurate. Uh, also, it's, it's in this story, it's not accurate. Uh, <laughs> The captain that sent the three heroes definitely looks a lot like Captain Verendel. <laughs> um, and there's a, there's a sort of, uh, is this a song or a story? How is this playing out? Um, it's both. An elaborate uh, poem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's like some of the sea shanties. I mean, they tell a story, but they're sort of sung. Um, so yeah, it, it's okay. a performance. Okay, it's a, it's a full performance Spoken of word. everything. <laughs> Spoken word with a little illusion and a little magic and a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, yeah, He's cheers. The occasional bit of guitar strumming, but that's as far as it gets for the guitar. <laughs> it sounds like one chord. He just plays the two chords for all he's worth. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> um, well, there's a pretty rousing response in the room. Um, there are a lot of people who are like, you know, seem a little bit skeptical, uh, especially after uh, Regalesta called out. But that's not what happened. Um, but others definitely seem to be appreciating it. And you do hear kind of the murmur of uh, Captain Verendel's name uh, in the room a bit afterwards as people are kind of like, you know, I always thought he was up to up to uh, really help this town out and. Uh, some pretty positive uh, spin towards him. Uh, you find uh, uh, sort of fresh bread on your table when you return, uh, as Sandy kind of uh, uh, says uh, says to you, kind of probably because Silas is still performing, but to the others, um, they heard that all the way back into the kitchen because <laughs> uh, her sister is the baker and uh, insisted on sending out fresh bread. Um, do you well, ask? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Uh, but thank you. I thank all of you. Although she looks at Regalesta with some <laughs> some sort of confusion as she seems to be your lone heckler. Um, do you ask for donations? Do you, do you pass the hat afterwards? Um, he probably wouldn't specifically ask for it, but he does perform here. So there probably be kind of a standing thing that there's something at the... Well, for want of a better term, the cashier, the the desk, the front area. Okay. Uh, the uh, the uh, there's a cry for more. Actually, as soon as you're finished, kind of like that was a great story. Now do six more, uh, as the crowd is is eager and into it. Um, oh, you can do. It. By the by, the end of the night, um, they have collected together uh, several coins for you. I'm just going to roll that here. So, seventeen gold. That's a good roll. Nice. Toss good night. coin to your warlock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and pays to be a bardlock. <laughs> um, mm -mm -mm -mm, there we go. Uh, and twenty-eight silver. Which for this room is is fairly good. Um, the room is packed, so you kind of imagine that just about everybody uh, contributed at least a coin or two, uh, and some of the bigger spenders dropping in a, a gold. 
Um, after you decide to take your break and kind of towards the end of, of the meal, you've had a chance to really eat. Um, the door kind of swings open and someone comes in looking completely soaked. Uh, and there's a sort of rousing cheer for them to come into the room. And they kind of stomp towards uh, the door, kind of wringing themselves out as they go. Uh, they just kind of shrug and uh, got caught in the rain. It's an old uh, old fisherman. Doesn't really fish that much anymore. Silas Jeffrey is so many dries out lately. Um, and it kind of looks strange at you at your approach, but then as the sort of uh, the 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 water starts to sort of drip away and he can feel himself getting better, it, it's it's not quite as fast as that, but uh, not quite a, a, a swoosh, but because uh, it, it's only like one cubic foot at a time, so it's like this. Oh no, this is his new uh, thing. Oh, that's right, the expanded one. Yeah, Sorry. He, he can completely dry one target. So yes, uh, uh, it, it is it is like that then, where the the water kind of all zoosh, kind of flows aside and then lands on on the uh, floor. Uh, he's completely right. dry. If there's a if there's a spittoon or something nearby, he'll aim for that. <laughs> it's a little bit better joint than a spittoon room, but uh, um, but uh, you do see a a bucket nearby where a bucket and a mop actually by the door where Sandy has been kind of cleaning up after people have they come in and you kind of fill the bucket with the water. Uh, thanks to your lad. Yes, uh, no problem, friend. Call me Bara. Okay, Bara. Um, and again, kind of an old fisherman. You've seen him around. He's He doesn't fish anymore, but he has lots of advice for fishermen who come by down the dock, which is usually where he can be found uh, as, as uh, people are going out on the boats. He's still up just as early as he ever was, uh, but uh, he's got plenty to say if anybody will stop and listen. Yeah, he probably has plenty of advice for anyone who happens to look his way. <laughs> it's, it's probably true, too. He's greeted with familiarity at the table, though, and sits down. And uh, you you kind of hear as you step away the, the, the table kind of like, you just missed the best stories ever. Ah, I've got my own stories. Um, but then they proceed to kind of replay their own version of your story, which you can kind of hear playing at tables around you. Uh, and it's it's probably pretty satisfying, I would imagine, to hear that impact. Yeah. Yep. Silas will just sit there and listen, okay. finish his food, and uh, then after a bit, he'll just uh, he'll tell Annie and Medrick, it's like, I better go. I got other people to take care of, but uh, I'll be back uh, first thing in the morning uh, whenever you want to head out. All right. Are we heading out to uh, retrieve the heart? Next. I, I I think that's where we have to go next if we're going to finish at least the water assault in the town. I will yeah. have it back. It is weakening not to have it. How long are you going to last? I do not know. But I can feel its loss. I do not like this weakness. Have a good night, and Medrick, try not to burn any more floors. I'll do my best. He'll, he'll give him a he'll reach up and give him a clap on the shoulder. <laughs> Later. His, his skin is warm to the touch. Not quite uncomfortably, but noticeably. Uh, and then yeah, Stylus will go get his horse and he'll ride back home to realize that, that Medrick would make uh, someone like a wife very happy because he yeah. warms up the bed quite, quite significantly. <laughs> Maybe even the bed next door. Um, <laughs> I wonder if you could capture, just put him in a, in a, in a like a, I was going to say put him in a capsule. That sounds pretty bad, but he could heat an entire place just by himself. Just sort of, <laughs> that's a weird thought. Uh, like make it, make it, make it the capsule in an entire room. At, in the basement, <laughs> and it would heat the entire apartment. Just have him take a nap in the oven. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the the night passes. I'm assuming Silas, you're heading back home to uh, way across. Yeah. So it's a pretty. I will pretty... ask uh, Regalest. Otherwise, we wind down supper. Uh, I'll ask her what she's going to do once she has her heart back. 
um, she seems a bit taken aback by the question, kind of like she'd never really thought about it. Uh, I'm not sure, but if Taraz is coming back, I will fight him. Beyond That's that, good. I do not know. Maybe find my memories or find if any of my people exist or what does exist of my people and maybe correct it. We'll help in whatever in whatever way we can. You also mentioned a trident. Yes. It is a family heirloom. But I must ask you this. If, if my heart is being used by Taraz, you must not let him have it. If you must, destroy it. It might not right. go well for me, I do not know. But I could not live knowing that I had, that I was part of this. Well, you were not a part of this. You didn't exactly volunteer your heart to him. But I will not let him keep it. Neither will I. You are good. Despite your, um, connection to a god. I do my best to drive away the darkness. Darkness is not so bad. Silas, as you're leaving town, you start to sort of cross across different streets and make your way out. And there are more people out, but there's also more signs of the long storm having had some some devastating effects. Um, not only just on the on the streets themselves, which are either mud or turned up uh, cobblestone. The buildings themselves, after such a long time being soaked, you can see large quantities of moss and mold growing on them. Um, you can even see where um, first floors of buildings look almost like they've been washed away, like the, the water had nowhere to go, and it started pooling up in alleyways and started to, to seep into buildings. Mm. But you're also somewhat surprised to see what remains of the storm still having a major impact. One street you pass by has a massive crater in the middle of it. And you can only imagine, given the pool of water that's at the bottom, the, the mud that's splattered on the buildings nearby, the small stones that were kicked up, that the when the spout focused there, it was like a river pouring through a stone and wor worried its way through that, that uh, area. Nothing has been done to repair that. Numerous several or small towns, or sorry, small streets, show signs of whatever was there from the uh, public buildings or from any of that space kind of washed away. Almost like details have been removed, worn down under the, under the first the heavy storms of continually going, and now the focused water that's there. Um... One thing you're surprised is a large rock, smooth and sitting in the middle of one street with a crater around it. And then a small stone lands not too far away from you, picked up by the spout itself and launched this direction. I will go over just a knock on the rock. Solid stone, smooth mm. uh, by being probably underwater for a long time but how big like is it person sized or uh it's about the size uh, about a basketball okay hmm um, at one point you uh see the side of one building that has a large hole in the wall that faces the water and imagine that more than one rock has probably been thrown in this time you find uh yeah uh, a piece of wood speared into the ground. Uh, the piece of wood is about uh, eight feet long. Uh, it looks like it's uh, heavy and covered in tar and and, uh, and pitted, and you realize that was probably part of a ship at one point. 
uh, throwing yeah. a spear by the by the uh, spout. Um, yeah, we got to get rid of that, and then perhaps the town can be fixed up. Um, yeah, and at least one building as you pass by, uh, and you can see that may have been the bearer of the entirety of the spout, and looks like it was just crushed downward on top of itself. Is it a building that I recognize, or just a Wyndham building? Looks like a, a rooming house. You've probably passed by it before, but you've never been inside. Okay. There's no people around it. There's no signs of, of, of anything living or active within. You imagine whoever was there left, found another place to be. But while the storm itself was, was raging and keeping the town kind of... Uh, in, inside all the time the spout while limited in scope um, may also be worse like all of the fury of that storm now focused into small places most of the time it does yeah. seem to be further down closer to the bay and you can kind of hear it like a sort of constant spray every once in a while though it sweeps across the town you manage to avoid coming directly in contact with it but you can hear it just a street or two over Back at the uh, village, um, people are generally asleep. Uh, it would be late enough that the fisher who's going to get ready in the morning would already be in bed. Um, you come back to your home and yeah. find uh, uh, kind of Nikki in a pile of, of blankets, half asleep in the middle of the, of the, the main room. Your parents are both there as well, sleeping. Snuggled up with Gideon, who I haven't had with me for a bit. Probably. Actually, Gideon would awake as you came in, kind of peer its head up and, and fly over to you. And Nikki also kind of uh, yawns a little bit, half opens an eye, sees you there. Looks like it kind of caught between the, oh, hey, I want to go see Dad, and I'm asleep now. Yeah, five more minutes. <laughs> um, well, uh, he'll say hi to his uh, to his parents and and uh then to, it's like looks like someone needs to head to bed and uh pick up nikki and hug him and he'll uh just give his parents a nod and then take nikki up to bed to put him to sleep nikki looks up at you and kind of half awake blinks his eyes are vertical orange slits within a green background reptilian in nature he blinks again they're back to their normal uh, yeah, well <laughs> the mother works in mysterious ways <laughs> Indeed sometimes it's good to be a cultist <laughs> um yeah, no, he'll just, uh, he'll make sure that uh, he gets to bed and he'll probably read him a bedtime, well, tell him a bedtime story until uh, he nods off. So that, uh, so that he's still around until uh, Nikki falls asleep. Just for fun, give me a performance check. Great. Natural <laughs> one, of poor kid nightmares. <laughs> Eleven. Okay. The only danger that you you run into here is that the story is too interesting, and Nikki keeps trying to stay awake for the first story and manages to, but then you kind of get another story, which is a little bit more calm. Uh, he's up later than he probably should have been. I tell him the story of the fisherman's income tax code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's kind of drifting off to sleep, but Daddy, we don't pay taxes. Um, uh but yeah, there's a restful night had for all. Any other things before we we veil to that night or veil the next morning? Not really, no. Uh, Silas at some point needs to talk to his parents about uh, Molly, but he'll leave that for now. Okay. Annie and Medrick, any last uh, activity before you snuggle off to bed? I'll ask Annie if she remembers where uh, Lysandra is staying or went off to because it would be interesting to have a 
Regalista have a chat with her? I think she went to town with the lady that was with us. The lady whose name I also can't remember. <laughs> yeah. Again, I, I started a second notebook and I don't know where my first one is. I'm, I'm struggling to remember. Because I have since her moved. <laughs> um, but yeah, she. I, I think she went with the... She was a tailor. Uh... And she, they, they left together. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if I have her name right on hand, but I believe that's where she, I where might. she was last you'd seen her. But I mean, so much has happened in town. You're not really sure where some people have gone to uh, as well. Where is Rigolesta staying? I, I'd offer her to stay in my room. Okay. She takes the bed. Yep. She doesn't That's even fine. ask. It's just sort of like, oh, this is where I'm staying. Um, and kind of lies down. Um, make a uh, intuition, uh, insight roll, Annie. No. <laughs> okay. You're really tired. You go directly to sleep. Yo. Um, morning comes. I have a bed roll. <laughs> Um, is Silas intended to kind of head out early so that he can be there when they wake up or is he going to be there um, when they are well well woken and breakfasted? Uh, I think latter. He'd be there until uh, his parents and Nikki are awake and probably have breakfast with them and then head in. Okay. So do you want a scene with the parents or, or do you want to describe uh, No, not for the moment. Again, like, he does have something to talk about with his parents, but not at the moment. Okay, it'll, just checking. It'll be a bit. Um, Annie and Medrick, please make a perception roll each, please. Please, please. Okay. Meh. All right. Um, Annie's never surprised, but she is the first to react to a loud crashing bang and the whole building seems to shudder. Uh, it does wake Medrick as well and uh, Regalesta uh, is sat up in bed looking confused. Uh, actually, Annie, also make an insight check at this point. Okay. So first the, the loud bang and crash, the sound of wood splintering, the feel of impact on the building. Um, as you sit up and kind of orient yourself, Annie, you look over at Rigalesta, who by now has reverted back to her crystalline form and is hanging well over the end of the bed, uh, kind of cramped in. Maybe what it's was because, that? Maybe it's because of the the, uh, the rest restoration of her form, or maybe it's something you didn't notice because you were tired last night. But you can see the look of pain, and you can see the look of... Um, weakness crossing over Regalesta uh, that she seems to have been able to hide from most so far but in this moment of, of surprise something maybe was revealed that she didn't intend and quickly she sort of seems to regain composure uh, and say something that you do not recognize in a language that seems uh, multi-tonal like two or three words are being saying, said at the same time uh, and then she pauses and seems to concentrate. But, Annie, you're the first to react. Uh, Medrick, you've just woken up. What are you going to do, Annie? Um, I'm going to run to the window to okay. see what's going on. Um, you run to the window, and you can see that suddenly water is pouring across the side of the window at about a 45-degree angle uh, coming from the direction of uh, the bay itself. I'm assuming your room, I don't know why I've assumed this, but it's on the on the sort of back end of the inn and on... I think that's uh, what was... Yeah, kind of, but that's what was, yeah. kind of uh, more or less uh, sort of, to get my angles correct, sort of southeast, but not facing the bay. Um, but you can see that the water is pouring over the building and you can kind of hear it now kind of banging against the roof as well. And then there's a second bang. At this point, Medrick, what do you do? I jump out of bed, and I, I go look out the window, too. Okay. 
Um, I'm assuming your rooms are basically side by each, and you also see the the rain kind of pouring down. Uh, both of you make a perception check at this point. All right. It is uh, Medrick who notices within the water that you can barely see through that's streaming across the window, you make out what looks like a body flying through the air and then smashing into the mud of the street below. Okay. There's noise from within the inn as other people are waking up now and starting to uh, come out into the hallway. Shouting is starting to happen. Uh uh yeah uh annie's gonna grab her robe and run downstairs yeah medrick will also grab his stuff and run downstairs okay. well not eh. armor or no armor probably no armor right now but yeah, just chill and hammer it takes a few minutes to put on armor by the way yeah, so just grab shield, grab hammer, run down and investigate the body. Did it look like a dead body or like a creature well, that wants to kill me? Before we get there, I, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but as you step out in the hallway, um, Regalesta is right behind you, Annie. She has not assumed the other form. She's still in her tall, crystalline form, seeming to not really think about that at all. Um, Medrick, as you step out of the hallway, you see someone down the hallway. This would be towards the direction of where the bay is. Uh, coming out of their mm -hmm. their uh, their room, uh, they te seem to be holding their head and covered in blood. It's a it's a large um, uh, balding uh, man. Um, you've seen them before. They're one of the uh, the people that normally works down with the caravans and sometimes has his own caravan. Um, um, I'll call out to him. Uh, and he seems to be stumbling hey, what out and holding his head. You can see that he's bleeding from the top of his head. Looks a little disoriented. I'll ask him, what happened? Uh, he kind of uh, looks at you, and you can see that his eyes are a little scattered. Um, he's having a hard time concentrating. You can see now there's a big gaping wound, or gashed wound, rather, on the top of his, of his head, which is bleeding profusely. Uh, Annie, you I... step out of the hallway. You see Medrick standing before this this person. I grab a towel uh, okay. and Mod's run over and try to... Yeah. Well, I, I'm i wearing a robe. I grab a robe. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, I, gra I grab a towel. Too. I, I, uh, okay. Put some pressure on it. Um, he kind of accepts the towel and, and kind of looks both back at the two of you. He's about to speak, but then he looks beyond the two of you down the hallway to where Regalesta is standing in the hallway, somewhat hunched over, because the hallway is not t quite tall enough for her normal form. And he, his eyes go wide, and he kind of stumbles his words and points at her uh, in confusion. Uh, oh, uh, reckless that, just normal form. And there's a strange look on her face when she looks down, and as she takes a few steps forward, res resumes once again the, the humanoid form. Um, forgetting for a moment to also put on clothing, which is sort of the last thing that forms in the illusion that, 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 that's cast over her. Illusion or not, you're not really sure because she doesn't seem to be hunched over. Uh, but the, the fellow's expression changes. You kind of imagine as you're standing in front of him, Annie, that, that for him, this has got to be the weirdest dream he's ever had. Uh, to, be, to be kind of at first you know, maybe attacked in his dream and then to see some incredible giant become a beautiful woman in front of him. And then he's like, I don't understand what's going on. I'm not sure it's all worth it. And he kind of winces at the pain. And as you look uh, kind of beyond him, uh, and Medrick, you'll also notice as well, there's a bit of a breeze that seems to be coming in from his room and the sound of, uh, of water hitting the floor. Um, you poke your head in. Yeah, I'll look inside the room, yeah. There is a large gap in the wall, about the size, uh, about half the size of a person, uh, and a large stone seems to have settled into the floor. It's actually broken through this layer of floor and it's kind of sitting on the uh, the sub layer, which would be the ceiling of the of the roof upstairs. It seems to have crashed through this room, just narrowly missing 
uh, this guy's bed, which itself is kind of skewed. And you get the impression that in, in many ways uh, he was lucky that his bed was hit and he flew out of his bed and hit his head on a nightstand nearby. And that's what caused the wound. He didn't get hit directly. Um, but this stone is about the size, uh, let's say, of a halfling. <laughs> it's an odd measure, but we'll go with the size of a halfling. It's a massive stone, and water is pouring in through the hole. Well, <coughs> the development. And Regulus is kind of um, looking over your shoulders. That does not look natural. No, no, it no. doesn't. And the guy's kind of holding uh, his hand. My name is Taroni, and he's holding his hand out to Regalesta, who kind of looks at his hand and then looks away. Oh, she sorry, can... she, she's not from here. And are you okay? Uh, it's a terrible dream. You can see he's he's kind of utterly shaken a little bit, but just completely confused, because nothing in the last five minutes has made any sense. Um, it looks like a rock of, came through your wall. Regal Lester kind of pushes through the three of you uh, mm -hmm. into the room, kind of looking at the rock, reaches down, picks up the rock, which doesn't make any sense when she looks like a fairly skinny elf, but knowing who she is, it might make a little bit more sense. It takes a little bit of effort. You can see a little bit of strain. Uh, Annie, from where you saw the pain that she had this morning, um, whatever trick she's using now to not look like herself it seems like it slips a little bit as she picks up the rock it does require effort it does seem to hurt but she does it anyway and kind of picks it up and throws it out back out through the hole you hear it crash down on the street below she kind of <laughs> sticks her head out the window I didn't hit anything just uh, be careful but thanks for taking care of the rock I can do nothing for the whole. All... And she's kind of standing in front of it. The thing you notice is that her clothes are not getting wet, but the water would be clearly hitting her. I'll stabilize uh, the bleeding. Actually, on the guy's head. Notice more than that is the floor around her is not getting wet either. Wow. Well... As you kind of look at it, it's strange because certain things seem to be shielded by magic, but it's as though the water pouring in through the hole, she's absorbing it. Or at least that's one way to describe it. Uh, what were you doing? Sorry. I was going to try to stabilize the bleeding on the guy's head. Okay. You can make a medicine check. Oh, red. What's my medicine? Okay, yeah. Plus five. Okay. Um, hey. It's it's one of those cases where a head wound, as you kind of realize when you move the towel around a little bit, it's actually a very small wound, but head wounds will bleed like nothing. Uh, and uh, you're able to kind of push the towel around, kind of sweep back some of the dirt or some of the, the blood and fold it over in such a way where you tell him to kind of, okay, hold here. <laughs> and that's all he really has to do to kind of stop it and staunch the bleeding. He seems to be in shock. Uh, it seems to be, he's starting to wake up or rather starting to realize that he is awake and that this isn't some sort of really weird dream. Uh, by the way, the room uh, looks fairly nice. Um, it looks as though he's probably lived here for a while, or this is his permanent residence. Uh, it's got some some nice uh, uh, silks over on one side. There's a couple of nice big chests as well. Um, you you kind of imagine that, yeah, as a caravaner, he has a permanent place here. Um, after a few seconds, the, the, the water outside seems to stop uh, pouring down uh, on this space. And uh, Rega Lester looks over her shoulder. It has moved. Was it the water spout? It was probably the water spout, wasn't it? It was. It must have picked up that rock. Damn it. All right, well, uh, we're going to have to let them know downstairs that they need construction. I need to sit down, says uh, the fellow in front of you. 
Yeah, you might need a new room, too. Oh, I've just gotten used to this one. I don't like the view anymore. It's got too much of a sea view. He's trying to laugh and joke, but it's kind of coming across as just trying to keep talking. <laughs> more than Yeah. <laughs> um, do, you, do you need I'm, anything? Um, I think I've got some some 12-year-old uh, uh, scotch here. Well, it wouldn't be scotch, I suppose. Whiskey around here somewhere. And he starts sort of rummaging uh, across. Uh, he seems to be as he kind of tilts over to open up one of the one of the uh, uh, boxes. He sways a little bit, and you can imagine like, well, you know, head wound. Uh, he probably wasn't being very smart there. But eventually, he kind of finds himself sitting in front of uh, one of those one of those crates. He's got a, a very fancy looking bottle. Uh, he's pulled out a glass and he's poured a little bit into the glass and he's taken a shot, and it seems to help a little bit. Uh, be careful, you've lost a lot of blood. Having too much of it that quickly, it might make you really happy in the short term, but really sad in the long term. He looks a little as bit of raises the glass and says, oh, I'll drink to that. He proceeds to have another. <laughs> um, I'll look at the hole that's been left by the rock. Mm-hmm. Is there a way to like patch it up a little bit? Like, I don't know, take a curtain and like. Uh, you could probably, well, there's, if you had some a nail or a tack, you could tack a curtain across it. That'd be about it. Yeah. You could do something like, I don't know, overturn the bed, but that might be a bit extreme. Well, the bed's broken anyway, so. <laughs> True. I'll take True. his mattress, I'll put it on the floor so we can sleep on that at least, and whatever pieces that I can find from the bed that are usable i'll try to block the hole in the wall temporarily you kind of just put the the, the frame in the bed across and there's there's like a wooden slat on the bottom that's sort of keeping it from being a big breezy hole to now being only slightly breezy still know there's a hole there kind of hole yep uh i'll head downstairs okay. um and you actually go almost run Sally. into uh run to run into sandy who's running up the stairs at that point <laughs> What was that? Uh, something hit the building and broke a hole in the wall in someone's room. What? I like guide her up to Dude's room. All right, she she goes over and kind of takes a look at the hole, but takes more of a look at the at the fellow and kind of walks over to try to soothe him. She he offers her a drink and she accepts <laughs> it, which seems a little un, un, unusual for Sandy. But looking at the hole, maybe maybe not so much. Um. <laughs> Who put the hole in the floor? The rock did. Rock? And yeah, there's an odd conversation between the two of them as Regalesta explains that there was a rock in the room and then she pushed it out. Um, but for the two of you, what are you doing? Are you going to stand around with this? Or are you I just remembered, like, right, there was a body on the floor. Uh, on the ground, outside. Yeah, that, that's what I meant. Floor, okay. ground, words. <laughs> okay. Need more coffee. So are you uh, heading out to take a look at that? Yeah. Uh, is Annie going with them? If if Medrick men mentions a random body, she'll go. Yeah, I would have mentioned it. Yeah, I, I mean, probably in passing, it's like, there was a body, let's go look. Uh, eager 10-year-olds. Uh, <laughs> there was a body. Uh, you get outside, and the street itself is kind of, uh, kind of a, a muddy um, way. This is actually the same street where... About a, a couple of days ago, I think it was, there was the cart accident, and the mud, the mud is just about as thick as that uh, as was before, splayed out in the middle of the street, embedded in the mud of the street. So practically uh, within a couple of inches of the surface, uh, you see a, a, a body, indeed, a humanoid body, but a humanoid body with a tail, and you recognize the broken uh, body, dead, very clearly and easily seen to be dead of a sea devil that is splayed out along the street with an incredible amount of impact to be buried in the in the mud that much. Well, at least there's no big loss. That's good, at least. I'll turn it over, see if there's like any... Does it have any valuables? <laughs> well, you turn it over and the first thing you notice is just how smashed in the front of it is when it impacted and then sunk into the mud. 
Uh, it is carrying a very basic dagger that's slightly bent. That's about it. Yeah. I'll grab I'll that take dagger it. Or if, if you want it. Or, yeah, and it can have it. I was just thinking, like, we shouldn't leave that on the street for any, like, hoodlum or child to find. <laughs> we'll leave the body. That's fine. But we'll take the dagger. <laughs> Um, but uh, well, we can always you... let Mim we, we can let Marigold know tomorrow morning. He'll take the body, I'm sure. Um, but both of you kind of realize just from the, the angle of this is th whatever the spout had caught up, the rock and this were both thrown by it with significant force towards the town. And now there's a big hole in the side of the second floor of the Three Bells. Yelp. Sad That's faces. That's good. Um, I'm going to go get, excuse me, go get dressed, uh, put on my, my armor and grab my stuff. And I'm going to actually, um, yeah, I'm going to grab something to eat and I'm actually going to run over to the captain for a second. Okay. Uh, yeah, once everything is calmed down, I'll put on my arms. Um, as you're kind of going back inside and having sort of claimed the dagger, you can see that others are coming out of their houses and, and uh, out of the buildings nearby. And the, the the implant in the ground is gathering a little bit of attention. Some people are pointing up towards the, the hole in the wall, the three bells uh, as well. Both of you take time to to get ready. Um, there's a bit of a, of a furor kind of caused by this um, in terms of what's going on inside the place. Although... There are people still coming in because this is the, it was only a little bit early from where you intended to get up and there are already people who are coming in to get their, their meals. And uh, you actually see Lawrence in the main room talking to Sandy uh, and uh, kind of as you are leaving the building, um, both of you see him come back. He's got his uh, box of tools with him as well. You get the feeling that, that uh, he's already offered to help fix the hole for Sandy. Or at least nice. attach it temporarily. Um, That's good. Annie, you're going off to see the captain. Is Medrick going with you, or are you just going to go on your own quickly? Because Medrick will be I a mean, little bit longer than you. Uh, it, it, it's up to Medrick if he wants to come. Uh, I'm just running over to tell him the situation of what just happened over here. And yeah, if other rocks have been hitting places. Also, has Gaetano been around? Yeah, I'll go with Annie. Okay. As you travel over, you actually find, again, the streets are pretty uh, rough and muddy. And you see the, the, the windmill in front of you and notice that while not a hole, there is a large rock embedded in one side of it. Um, not as big as the one that hit the three bells, but uh, about the size of a cannonball. And it didn't crack through the exterior wall of the, uh, the windmill. The building was obviously made very, very well. And one of the reasons they chose this one for... A uh, sort of a safe place for them to be is because of that, but still, it got hit. Uh, and uh, the captain is standing outside. I do ask to stay in my room. <laughs> we'll be uh, right back. She nods to you. Make an insight check. No. <laughs> okay. You find the captain standing outside, pointing up, talking to Riemann, actually, and pointing at that. Um, you can hear Riemann kind of swearing a little bit uh, and then nodding and goes back inside. The captain notices the two of you coming and, and waves. That's the part we still need to deal with. Yeah, I got your message. Um, so this is part of it, then. And this is going to end? Yeah. Hopefully... There's something going on, like a spout of water that my my Marie's brain is going yeeting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, that's throwing rocks and boulders and sea devil corpses. Throwing yeah, you might want to notify uh, Dr. Marigold that there's a sea devil he could use next to the Three Bells Inn. Well, that, I guess that's... Is that good news? I'm having a really hard time figuring out which parts are good and bad here. I don't know either. So. 
The clouds are gone. Okay, I'll take that as a win. I'll start some patrols up. I haven't we knew been... We knew this was a two-part process. We've done the first part. I haven't actually been inside a city that's under siege, but I guess we can treat it that way. Um, I will see to make sure that people are getting out of vulnerable areas. Do you know if there's any pattern? Are they attacking specific things? As far as I've seen, it was the three bells and this, unless we've seen noticed anything else. All right. Well, I'll see what I can do. Thanks so far. Oh, and... Why are random people coming up to me today and thanking me? Do you have anything to do with that? You can thank Silas for that one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Somewhere Silas is grinning like a madman. He, he told the story of how three heroes sent by the captain to stop the storm. He was very unsubtle about it. Well... I guess I'll thank him. It was a strange morning, that's for sure. Especially with reports of stuff like this happening all over the town. First time I've heard of a corpse, but there were a lot of rocks. It wasn't so bad when it was just the water, although some of the buildings did have some problems. But uh, so far, only a couple of people have died, which is good, under the current circumstances. That is good to hear. Um, so... Yeah, that's the current situation. We need to go out to sea to figure out what to do about this water spout. All right. So, Anything that you can is do to step help? Two. Um, I don't know. I don't even know what's... We're kind of winging it a lot. All right. Well, I'll try to make sure that Eddie. everything is under order here. Where, where's Recalista? I, I told her to stay in my room. All right, good, good. Uh, and yeah, uh, also, we saw Gaetano's boat come in again. Has he been uh, to see you? No, I expected him yeah. to be by, but I haven't seen him. Okay, well, we did see his boat manage to get in. Uh, so. Yeah. Good to know that he hasn't stopped here. Well, good information to have. I know what you mean. Um, if, if you do see him, I do need to talk to him. I'll send him your way. Uh, and yeah, we're going to go try to deal with this water spout somehow. Good luck. Uh, Thanks. Try to probably going to need it. Try to keep yourself safe. And um, that's a good look on you, Medrick. Oh, right. To the audience. Thanks. <laughs> and bid you on your way. I'm going to assume you return back to the Three Bells and wait for Silas to show up? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Go okay. check on regular stuff. She's not there. Yep. We now have to go find her. Great. Um, Silas, you uh, arrive. You're actually served meals. The kitchen is still running, and Sandy's trying to keep the dining room kind of normal, but the talk in the room is very clearly about the fact that the building itself is kind of under attack. Um, um, yeah, I mean, Silas has already eaten this morning, so... Uh... He'll maybe uh, order some uh, some travel food for us because I don't know how long we're going to be gone. Uh, and then he'll do a uh, uh, he'll do some performing to just keep people calm. There's a call for a sing us that song you sung last night. That was pretty good. They can do that. Um, so Silas, Annie, Medrick, you've all returned. You start to. Uh, the two two needed to have breakfast or having their their meal. Um, it it seems to be an extra serving. <laughs> um, while we're eating, I'm going to actually like furiously scribble down a note for Gaetano just in case he comes while we're gone, uh, explaining 
um, what happened with uh, the Baron's daughter, uh, what happened with the storm so far and where we're going to be heading. Uh, just, you know, the, the cliff notes of this has been what's going on. Um, if I'm not here, this is where I am. Uh, and yeah. Uh, and like I'll, I'll mention the, the meeting with the Baron's daughter and that she's also very worried that something's wrong specifically something happened to her mother that did something to her father okay um, as the three of you are sitting there making your plans uh, and having a bit to eat and, and Silas occasionally going to, to entertain the crowd uh, the door comes open and there, standing, looking undisheveled, despite the weather that might be outside, is Regalesto. You can see that she has uh, mud on her hands and her feet as well, which you realize now she doesn't wear shoes. Uh, and she kind of stomps over and sits down at your table and then grabs something off of one of your plates and starts to eat it. That's fine. Uh, where have there you are been? more rocks. There are more rocks I found. I threw some I of them see. back. Thanks for your help. Yeah, I noticed people. that on, when I was in town uh, last night, it looked like it. They've, they're using the thing to catapult stones of the town. And sea devils. Oh, bodies of the dead. Oh, well, hopefully dead. I don't know if that was dead before it hit the wall or if it died hitting the wall. It actually didn't hit the wall. It hit the street. Okay. Just imagine the, the, the sort of form of it flying out and then splat onto the street. <laughs> splat. <laughs> Regalesta okay. uh, speaks. Your town is very badly protected against siege. It's going to say casually as she's eating. We've noticed... I cannot disagree with that. <laughs> this is a fact. This would never have happened in an Athlonian town. They are all very well protected. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we're sure. So, we are going to the water. Yes? Yes. We've got to find some way to get out there. What is your Do you plan? still have the pearls of water thing? No, we gave those back to the t the uh, uh, lighthouse. However, I can I, I can allow us to breathe underwater. Uh, it'll last a day, so that's not an issue. That's good. But that's a good six or eight miles out into the water, and I don't know if you guys can swim that long. Mm. Uh, we'll probably need to uh, rent a boat to take us at least somewhere near there. Yeah, that's good. There are many boats. We could take any of them. No, we have to rent them. They're not ours, as Annie said. <laughs> kind of like the food. They're not just to grab. Do you think they would stop you or be bothered right now? Yes, yes to both. And also yes to throwing us in jail. You would be imprisoned for trying to help? You have a very strange world. Well, if we ask them, they may help us willingly. But if we just take them, then we're stealing. If Maybe help. Captain Farindale can get us a boat. Yeah. How long would this take? I mean, Silas, you know the people by the docks more than either of us. I mean, we might be we might be able to find someone willing to take us out there, um, but I mean, I don't know how close they would want to get, especially if the Sahagans start turning the water spout at us 
if they can use it at the ship, then uh, they'll have to head back. But it should be at least able to get us close to it. And then, I mean, we're going to have to swim anyways once we get there. Yes. You said you can breathe the water. Yes, I, I have a, I have magic that can allow us to breathe. Then why do you need a boat? Because it would take us a long time to swim. Then I know what I can do. I can get us there. Fast. Oh, nice. No Ow. worries to ask someone for a boat. Good. How? I will ask for friends. Do you trust me? Well, we trusted you to get us out of the acid pit. Silas just looks at her and I trust you to get us there. And can you get us back? If I am alive, yes. If any of us are alive, yes. And we will be. Because we need to be. Yes, she we step, will. She steps up. Now, shall we go? I do not wish to wait for more of this town to be crushed by rock. Me neither. Yes. So I'm just going to eat a lot faster. Um, I do seal my letter with my signet ring. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. And you give that to Sandy? Yeah. Okay. It's... Yep. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if Gaetano come, comes in, this is for him. She raises an eyebrow, but just sort of takes it, puts it behind the bar. Will do. My my thing, my emblem is a little bit more niche, so. <laughs> it's the, uh, was it the rose that we decided upon? The, the, the rose with the butterfly and the ivy. Right. She raises an eyebrow, but she doesn't ask questions. Uh, and we go. Uh, Silas will, will uh, pay her, uh, you know, I guess, a couple of gold for the um, the food, uh, probably wrapped in uh, oil skin to keep some of the water off it. Okay. Then uh, he'll just let uh, Annie and Medrick know that we've got food if we need to stay longer than a few hours. Okay. And as you're you're kind of paying for it, and she hands over the food, she kind of uh, Sandy winks at you, Silas, uh, and uh, and says, uh, um, "Well, let's let's hope we have another great story of three heroes being sent by the captain." Well, if uh, if the water spout stops uh, bombarding the town, then that was us. Hopefully we come back from it. He gives her a smile and heads out the door. Um, as you head out, uh, probably Annie and Medrick, who are behind you, sort of see a little bit of a look of concern across Sandy's face at the, at the uh, you know, if. <laughs> he doesn't like the conditional there. Um, but if it means when. Uh, Regalista leads you down towards the water. She walks confidently down the street. Um, and you kind of notice that as she's walking along, um, something may have shifted because she's no longer leaving footprints. And she's moving down uh, towards the, the, uh, the water. More and more scenes of, of uh, destruction are spotted as you go as the you know even the the uh, break wall the wall that's meant to keep the tides from washing up over the town itself has been struck a couple of times um, by some small stone some larger and there's some work going on to try to at least pile up and prevent the flood from coming in um, there's also signs that down by the very edge of the water where the dockside is the docks themselves are pitted with holes and have tons of, of, uh, of small breaks and tears 
to the point where you have to kind of pick your path carefully because there's no longer a straight uh, direction from one side of the dock to the other. Um, you see the uh, the uh, errant widow still docked uh, there, uh, but you're a little bit disturbed to see that uh, its main mast is broken in two uh, as uh, it looks like it got clipped by a rock coming by. Uh, but they're busy at work actually erecting a new mast. They've taken down the, the uh, sails, they've taken down the ropes, and are busy at work at that. Um, even as the water washes over them, at least doesn't seem to be throwing more at them. As you approach the water, and Regalesta sort of moves ahead, she no longer moves her legs, but proceeds further forward. And indeed, the illusion or the form or the shift or whatever it was that she had held before of, the, uh, of what she described as an Aroka or sea elf vanishes as well until she is her own self. Shouts can be heard from up and down the dock as people spy this strange creature leading up ahead of you. She floats down towards the water and sort of floats parallel to it, dipping her hands in uh, to, to kind of push against the waves. She calls out, but in a language you cannot even conceive of. It sounds like deep growls combined with hidden echoes, like a rumbling like and roaring. And yeah, something like primordial actually would be very similar to it, actually. Um, but in a way that seems to fold back upon itself. Again, the sound almost of more than one voice at the same time. The sound reverberates across the, the top of the water and echoes off of the boats. And then there's a spout of water that's spotted a few hundred uh, uh, feet or a, f a couple of hundred feet out from the docks. Small. And then another. And then another. And you hear a laughter coming from Megalesta. They came. I remember them, my friends, they came. And reaching the water, just outside from the dock, you see a pod of killer whales. My friends will help us get there. And we'll wait for you to return. Do not be alarmed. They are not likely to eat you. But I wouldn't get on their wrong side either. She says, Right, so they will you. get us there in one piece, correct? Oh, yes. You will have Silas to Silas already on. has a huge smile on his face and is attempting to go surf one. It seems calm and is kind of allowing you to, to step on it. It's very firm in the water. It is angling slightly and rolling slightly to see you, to kind of keep you in its vision. So it's a little bit like trying to stand on a rolling log. Yeah, he'll go hug its, uh, its top fin, dorsal fin. It lets out a sound. Yeah, Come on! on. It's great. <laughs> it lets out a sound of, of kind of surprise, but then sort of contentment, weirdly enough. And it's echoed by Regalesta as well. She dives into the water. Oh. Beside them. I'll follow. Same. Okay. There is uh, there are three three killer whales. And she directs each of you to kind of grab onto the large fin on the back. She herself does not. Instead, she kind of dives in the water and is almost invisible for a moment. And then you can see her kind of swimming upward almost effortlessly uh, till the point where she's standing vertical her feet just touching the uh, the water. Shall we go, my friends? And she seems to be joyful. Uh, Silas, that, that water spell, can you cast it? Oh, yeah. Uh, he'll... Uh, not technically done like a spell, but uh, his hands are busy, so he'll, he'll uh, wiggle his nose, and you can all uh, breathe water now. <laughs> is there any other effect besides the uh, the, uh, the little witchy nose thing? Uh, no, well, it's part of the invocation he's got for a gift of the deep. Uh, he can cast w uh, water breathing once a day without uh, requirements. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, basically, just uh, they probably feel something like they can, in fact, breathe easier out here. Maybe the mist in the air isn't a problem for their lungs anymore. Um, but each uh, of you feel the shift in your neck as it bulges slightly. 
And as you put your hands there, you actually do feel gills. That's creepy. This is weird. Useful, but, but creepy. And you see a look of appreciation from Regalesta. You have much power that is attached to you. Good. We will probably need all of it. If you are ready, try to keep up. And she sort of launches up and dives down into the water and begins to swim. You find that the, uh, the, the killer whales respond to each of you. How about an animal handling check from each of you just to see how well they respond? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's wisdom, though. It shouldn't be too, too bad. Famous last words. Yeah. Eh. Ooh, okay. Marie? They like Mar uh, they like sorry, Annie? <laughs> mm -hmm. The weirdness of the situation is kind of somewhat mollified by the fact that you rode horses. It's yep. kind of like a horse with no saddle, no reins. You don't know what language to speak to it. It probably would respond You're to not sugar cubes if you had them. You're not sitting on it. You're kind of grabbing onto it. But yet it, it, it feels as though it's, it sort of has an intuitive grasp of, of who you are. And you find it easy to kind of direct this thing. Should it ever come to it, uh, if there is any need to maneuver carefully with this beast, you have advantage. For Silas and Medric, the experience is a little bit different. Uh, for you, Medric, um, you kind of grab onto this thing, and maybe it's the fact that this creature most of the time lives underwater or near water that is considerably cooler, and the skin that you have right now is considerably warmer, mm -hmm. uh, that it may be a little uncomfortable and squirming a little bit underneath your, your movement, but you get the feeling that there's a sort of weird transference any friend of Regalesta is a friend of mine, and there's a benefit of the doubt being given to you. Cool. For you, Silas, there's a weird sort of kinship in a weird way, where it doesn't think of you as a writer. It doesn't seem to even think of you as a person. It seems to think of you as another creature like it, born of the sea. And in fact, you find this one diving deeper than the other two, almost by instinct. And then occasionally... Uh, just surfacing, but not quite enough that you would breathe normally, but it doesn't seem to care. It seems as though it sees you as a peer. But you're not in control of it either, more or less hanging on. I rub the base of its fin. <laughs> seems to Good appreciate it. boy, girl, whatever. It's hard to tell from this side. Which uh, it might also be an old bitey. <laughs> <laughs> old bitey has a much different form. Um yeah. And Regalesta leads you out towards the spout. It's easy to see the origin of it because it is a massive water spout in the middle of the bay. Uh, it is uh, easy to see, but also you can see that it sweeps back and forth. Not in a, in a, in a line. There's every once in a while a sort of cut in the, in the uh, water being thrown up. And then it kind of reappears, spouting out in another direction. Uh, every once in a while you do see something floating up in it. Another rock here and there. Um, not as large as the one you've seen, ones you've seen before, but uh, there is also bits and pieces of wood, not all of which seem to lance out like spears. Many of them sort of clatter down. Um, you can see a, a few of them clattering down upon the docks and people go scrambling, try to not being hit by, you know, even if it's awkward flying splinters, it's still going to hurt. Uh, so they try to keep out, away from it. Um, it takes you a considerable amount of time, but far faster than any of you could swim. Uh, these creatures seem to keep up a high pace. One can imagine that they are not only swimming under underground, they're actually dashing under underwater, I should say, uh, for a considerable period of time. Um, as you get closer, Regalesta slows down such that you can kind of see the edge of the spout um, and, and kind of indicates for everyone to slow down. Even if you tell it not to, the, the killer whale underneath you seems to respond to her first as a priority rather than your own wishes. Although you can try to over overcome uh, it or countermand it if you will. Um, she floats back to you and uh, the pod of whales kind of gathers around her with all of you on top as she uh, turns. We are not far now. It is below us, deep in the water, as we had all expected. I do not know what to do here. 
but this is it. I can feel my heart. It is here. It hurts to be this close. I am not sure how close I can go, but I will go as far as I can. Uh, can you see if there's any stingweeds down there? We can go closer to take a look. Now, we're obviously coming right to the, the end of our time here, but uh, I want to kind of set the scene and you can decide or, or have some idea of what to happen, what's going to happen next week. Um, are you going to take the killer whales closer? Are you going to start to swim at this point? You're still probably a hundred, uh, well, a couple of hundred feet away from the actual spout itself. Uh, Silas wouldn't want to get his uh, water ally uh, hurt, so he'd probably just let go and swim by himself. Yeah. Yeah, same, but I do have armor on, so swimming is going to be difficult. <laughs> yes, but swimming down would be a problem. Yes. So we don't... So we don't have another case of, yeah, I put the vase in my back pocket. Uh, I would like to make sure that uh, for next time, if there's any unusual things you are carrying that would not normally be something associated with just in a pocket somewhere, make sure to note there th those. Uh, in particular, okay. Medric, I suspect you are, but I want to make sure it's confirmed, uh, carrying the, uh, the weapon that you'd found before, the, uh, the sea devil weapon. Right, right, yeah, because... I wasn't carrying it like in the last adventure, but now that I know we're going to be going underwater, yeah, I'll be carrying that. Yeah, that's what I wanted to confirm that. So if there's anything else that I should be aware of, uh, obviously uh, Silas has pockets full of, of wrapped up food, uh, which are kind of in his coat, which I suppose if I you get the graveler orb. pockets, it'd be fine. Um, what's that? You got the graveler orb? Yeah. Okay. That is a fairly large thing. So it's, and it's pretty mm -hmm. heavy too. So it will make uh, swimming a little bit more awkward for you as well. Not that it isn't already awkward, um, but just to make sure that, so, so we are clear on what you are carrying and what you to choose to, to bring with you that might be difficult or awkward, uh, but which makes sense. So are She'd you have her to... normal kit. Okay. Um, are you going to, and I'm assuming Gideon, for example, is back with Nikki rather than here with you because yeah yeah he probably isn't bringing him along on the adventures very often because they get dangerous yeah so i'm assuming you're swimming forward you're gonna let the killer whales hanging out hang out some distance away um yep is that true yeah yep okay um as the four of you float closer and start to see this weird underwater swirl of water you start to dig deeper or float down deeper um, you see the source of what would be considered, I suppose, an underwater tornado. It seems to originate from a point on the uh, the surface of the um, of the floor of the of the water underneath. Uh, it seems to have a particular origin. From where you can see, there's a couple of things you can make out um, pretty easily. There are small pinpricks of light that you see some distance away, which seem to surround it. And as you get closer, you realize those pinpricks of light are not on the seafloor themselves, but instead seem to be suspended 20, 30 feet above it. Uh, and then as you get a little closer, you notice that, no, these are actually on the very tops of pillars which seem to surround this, uh, this thing. Periodically moving, uh, and I should say too that the center point where the tornado is gives off a small bluish glow. Um, which, Silas, you would interpret really as just being sort of pure magical force being driven. Um, in other words, it's not water that's being generated. It seems to be a force that's generated, and that force is churning up the water and pushing it outward from some sort of central point. Periodically yeah. around this area, you also note that there seem to be uh, large shapes moving that resolve themselves not only into sea devils, but a few of those uh, same large uh, chitin-covered creatures you fought on the dock. It's hard to estimate exactly how many there would be, and some of them are behind, presumably, where this large obstruction is. But you can see the sort of, uh, uh, you know, marauding or patrolling group surrounding them. That's from a couple of hundred feet away. You can look closer, you can move closer, um, or you can choose to go around it and try to survey it. Individuals can try to move forward. That's up to you. How do you want to approach this? 
And you can ask uh, well, questions think... too about the scene too, because I realize that some of it might not be obvious. Um, one thing Silas would definitely do is cast Pass Without Trace from the staff. So as long as Annie and Medrick are close to him, they're all they're both surrounded by kind of like a like like inky shadows. Um, okay. Which, if we need to make a stealth roll, will give plus ten to the stealth roll. Okay. And they cool. can't track us by oh sorry except by magic. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> we're just less likely to be seen. It might suppress Medrick's glow a little bit. Yeah, the the glow kind of works against stealth, but yeah, it's it's one of those. Um, you can you can sort of semi silence the bell he seems to carry with him. <laughs> in a way. Uh, Silas will uh, speak into their minds, saying it looks like it might be another construct of some sort, like a magical construct. Um, so there might be a device that we have to destroy like uh, the previous one. Other than that, there's a lot of things down there. Yeah, I see a lot of mother... F and I catch myself so I don't activate Graveler. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say it out loud, I think, for that. So oh, right, There's right. also the sense of intention as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, if it helps, um, if you move a little bit closer, uh, I'll give you a little bit more detail, you know, clearly. Yeah, I mean, it, it we'd probably s slowly be moving closer, just okay. Like very what cautious. Is, what yeah, yeah. Do is actually yeah, risky. I'll all... stay behind, and you guys can move closer because Silas can see really far underwater, and I can't. <laughs> what I will do is I'll move you all to the map. Okay. Actually, right now, uh, though, uh, Medrick may not know it. He can see farther than Silas can. Even underwater. Uh, underwater doesn't really change it. Okay. So where you guys are is in the lower oh, uh, right-hand corner. Oh, boy. i got to zoom out a little. And there you can see the pillars, each with slightly a little bit of, of light. As you can see, there is some some stingweed that seems to have been planted, but more or less uh, it looks like it's randomly spat, uh, uh, spattered here and there. Uh, one thing that you will uh, note as you move closer um, you can see them sort of uh, circling around, and as you watch, you see one of the uh, one of the Swagan, one of the Sea Devils, move a little bit too close. This guy over here, and moves a little bit too close into the swirl, and is lifted up into the swirl, and carried aloft, thrown up oh, by the. Uh, oh, yeah. itself. <laughs> okay, there used so to be a force ladder in town so, somewhere. Right? So yeah, for yeah. for uh, Annie and Medric. This is probably what happened last time. That probably wasn't intentional. That's a, that's but he was that. probably an accident then, so that's good. And he's not even that close to uh, to the, the the water. I can't uh, seem to move him at the moment, but I'll see if I can do this. Nope. Oh my God! The do not get too close to the thing. Oh yeah, that was the wrong keyboard. Oh. <laughs> Doesn't work. Yeah. Use the wrong wrong mouse. That's that's why. Okay. I really need to use the washroom. I'll be right back. Okay. Um, so I can answer a few questions about the map if you if you have particular ones. Uh, one thing you guys will notice as you get closer is there does seem to be some sort of pit or hole which seems to go into the ground. Um, you can also make out that among the, the pebbles and sand and dirt that's down there, there does seem to be something that looks more solid and more constructed. Something that looks like uh, solid uh, uh, stone, um, sort of carved blocks of stone set together. But you can see a little bit of it here. You can see a little bit of it within the center of the spiral. You also do notice the sort of glowing, glowing uh, symbol at the center as well. So you said there was a pit? Yeah. Is that so at the your... center? No, it's off to one side, actually. Okay, so it's... Okay, it I looks it like a spiral stairs. staircase because that's what I happen to have. Uh, okay. But it's actually more like a pit. It's set flat into the surface of this, and depending on the okay. angle, you can see you can see that there are, are stairs inside. Again, okay. I, I was limited by the mapping tools, and I didn't have a pit, so I just threw a set of stairs there. 
So Silas looking at this sees that it looks like the the magical pillars are sort of forcing the water into a spiral into the middle that then sort of shoots it out uh, over at the town. Yeah, It does seem that the effect is limited by the pillars or doesn't seem to be transcending the, the pillars. Whether the pillars have an active effect, it's hard to tell at this distance. Uh, okay. Keep in mind, too, that uh, the scale of this map is double uh, normal scale, so each square is actually 10 feet. That's how okay. large this is. Okay. So, for example, the, the radius so are the of the pillars all the same size, about... or is the map... Uh... So is the south pillar smaller than the uh, west and, the, and north pillars? It does appear that the pillars are slightly different size. They're also uh, slightly angled, slightly okay. angled outward from the okay. center point. Like leaning outward? Um, uh, yeah. Okay. From this distance, that's about all that you can make out for those. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Annie, while you're away, there does seem to be a pit in uh, what looks like solid stone. and I could hear you guys. Oh, okay. Perfect. Perfect. So any other questions about the this, this setup here? You do see these large uh, creatures sort of uh, walking around. And I'm not going to move them here in this particular scenario, but you can kind of imagine that they're moving in uh, mostly a, a, uh, a, a uh, counterclockwise direction around this trying not to get too close as they saw their, their friend and colleague launched up into the stratosphere by the, by this thing. Now, are they looking outwards for anyone coming in or are they, I, do they tend to look inwards at the massive watery thing? Or are they like um, throwing rocks into it? Well, they, they, they are occasionally throwing rocks into it, sometimes very large ones. Um, or bits of wood or whatever they happen to find around. Uh, they are focused mostly outward, however. Um, okay. It does appear like that they are guarding this. Yeah. Uh, among them, you also see right here someone which is familiar to you all. Um, he has four Oxia. arms and stands taller than the rest. It's not Oxia. Yeah. It's the okay. other leader that was with her down in the, uh, the grotto. Yeah, yeah, the uh, the war commander kind of guy. Yep. The guy who well, destroyed the temple. Yes. Yes, that guy. Mm -hmm. Medrick may have a date with him. Oh, yeah, just a bit. <laughs> um, Can we, and, and are we all, because uh, Silas, you said you were talking into our minds. Can we talk back, like, the entire time i think i always thought uh that people could but then i saw someone using it in an actual play and in theirs they couldn't talk back it was only that that person could talk out so this is the uh, warlock feature telepathy yeah yeah the yeah. the great old one warlock feature um from from the way that i would interpret that is a person can reply they can't initiate a conversation but they yeah. can reply if they're spoken to yeah, that's kind of what I figured. Can we communicate with Trina Lesta at all? Um, you find you can speak. You can breathe water. It just doesn't carry as far. Right. Um, Rega Lesta okay. seems to have so, no problem understanding you, and she does not seem to move her lips when she speaks. Okay. So I'll very quietly whisper to her, like get awkwardly close, because I don't want these other jackasses to hear me. Oh. <laughs> Can you hey. guides? No, I mean not other like the Sawagan, not you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so Regalesta, can you control currents? Can you push them into the spout? I have some of that power. I, it is not as strong. Uh, without my heart, I fear I well, I guess you might say my heart is not in it. But if I do this, it will only affect one or two of them at a time, and the rest would know. All right. But it's good to know in case we get spotted. If they are close to Which it, I think I can happen. do this. Yes. So, Regalistic, 
him with us. Yes. Okay. okay. Also, sure. Yeah. Remember, she she led you here essentially. Um, yeah. I I thought there was a problem with her coming closer though. So well, she she, she did say she can't come too close, and you do. Uh, the thing that Annie had noticed earlier is now apparent to all of you that she is in pain uh, and cringing a bit, but trying not to show it. But at this point, she can't help but show it. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I can't think of anything else. No. We'd probably just be... Are they moving around as they as they patrol, or are they kind of... You said they're moving counterclockwise, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to keep updating the map on that particular case, uh, but you can just kind of imagine that... Uh, basically, before we do anything, the first round of initiative will be me putting them in a slightly different position as they continue to move around. Some of them are, most of them are, are walking or, or really swimming um, counterclockwise. A few of them are lingering. You can see on the right-hand side, a few of them are kind of sitting up on rocks. Uh, they don't seem to be moving anywhere. Are they mostly walking around on the surface or are they mostly swimming up above it? They're keeping fairly close to the surface. Um, the larger ones seem to be keeping mostly in contact with the surface. Um, you, you gather that while they probably can swim pretty well, they probably don't swim as well as the others do. The others seem to have no effort whatsoever to, to swim around. And in fact, yeah. they're quite fast swimmers, too. Yep. <laughs> I can't think of anything else to, uh, to ask. Yeah. I mean, just as we go in, we'd probably try to go for a spot between to the groups, but that's in however it gets set up. So, um, okay. So yeah, I think. Given the potential here for this to turn into a fight, <laughs> uh, then I'm going to I'm going to take my prerogative and pause now for the episode, and we will pick up at the very beginning of next episode with you going after the uh the uh, water spout and trying to figure out how you can how you can defeat this this terrible evil and then write stories about it which seems pretty cool to me um so uh thanks once again to my players for uh digging into this world and being literally swept up in the in the in the uh liquid <laughs> form of of everything that's happening around you um, You're usually not this bad. I'm just, it's been a while since I've <laughs> yeah. punned this much. I need to, I need to. Uh, but if you, if you were uh, missing parts of this episode, you can always go to YouTube, youtube.com slash ENCIF1, or you can find us uh, on uh, Twitch on Sunday afternoons at three o'clock, twitch.tv slash ENCIF1. And uh, you can also go to uh, facebook.com slash LOTDI. To find, uh, you'll find the summaries now, thanks to uh, Pat, who's putting up summaries there of each episode, uh, and uh, we'll see what we all we can we can dig in, throw in in there as well. Uh, anything else, uh, guys? You want to say before we head out? Um, I we probably should state now who has that lion head necklace. Not that we'll necessarily face some fear, but I think right now Annie has it, but. Uh, uh, Silas would not be using it, but uh, if either of you are putting it on, that might be something good to know before we start the fight. Yeah. To be clear, it's a non-attunement item, but if you're not wearing yeah. it, we'll take an action to put it on. Okay. Yeah. Um, and its use as is as a reaction, so you'll have to have it on for it to be effective. Um, but is anybody wearing it? Not that I know of. I mean, if Medrick didn't want it and Silas didn't want it, I would wear it just in case. Yeah. Okay. Is it a wisdom? Is, fear is usually a wisdom save, right? Yeah. You okay, should. and I got like plus five wisdom for my saves, so Annie might make, might have better use of it. Yeah, my, my, my one wisdom saves. <laughs> cool. Now that I've said this, I'm going to roll a one on the next wisdom save I get. <laughs> and, and once, and you, just put it, once you put it on, <laughs> there is a sort of a weird sense of courage that flows through you, even as a sort of uh, uh, background effect. Um, you can feel and sense the effect of it. And you kind of imagine that um, even just wearing it makes you feel more confident, weirdly enough. Um, and it kind of you kind of know that you could face down anything at this point. Or at least that's what you hope. <laughs> it makes you want to talk like the lion from the Wizard of Oz. Put him up, put him up. <laughs> Come you on. Found your courage, of course. 
uh, anything else uh, people would like to mention before we head out? It's not a requirement, but nope. uh, I want to thank my players for uh, for for. I was about to make a ba another bad pun. I will avoid at least one pun. There you go, one pun safely avoided. But now, now we're wondering what it was. Damn it! You'll, you'll never know. You'll never know. <laughs> Uh, but we will uh, return once again next week for the, okay, fine. The next turn in the tide of events that happens in the Bay. Uh, thank you once again for joining us. Thanks for watching. And certainly most of all, thanks guys for playing. Thanks for running. <laughs>